Hey, thank you for having me. My name is Sid Druid. I'm the campus minister at uh, Davidson College. Woo! Uh, it's a small, large school, 2,000 people. Go Georgia uh, 7! Charlotte, North Carolina. Go Wildcats, go Steph Curry. Um, <laughs> it's our claim to fame. We just say it as much as possible. In case it's an under armor here. Okay, so I'm married. I have uh, 13 years. That. Uh, yeah. uh, and I've got three children, uh, twin six-year-olds, and uh, a four-year-old named Millie. So, let's see. Other things to know about me, I think I'm here for two reasons. Uh, as Nate alluded to, I was born in the Midwest. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, born and raised 18 years, same house. Yes. I love this part of America. Uh, I'm so excited for fall. I can hardly contain myself. You know, being in North Carolina, it's still summer. It's like December. Uh, second thing that I'm here is I love RUF. Uh, I've been RUF for a while. Uh, this is my 10th year um, doing RUF ministry. So I spent two years as an intern in Central Florida, University of Central Florida. Roll of nights, anybody? <laughs> All right. Um, how about, uh, it, gets, it gets even more remote. And I spent four years Mexico. Uh, yes, all right. At New Mexico State University, uh, the, the lesser known of the two giant universities in New Mexico. And then that was for four years, to keep track. And then I came to Davis in 2013, and I've been campus minister there. So, kind of been around. Uh, to add to that, I also have Ohio. And then he thought, look, by the way, do you guys know where Columbus is in Ohio? You know, two hours south of Factory Sadness. And then uh, also two hours north of Skyline Chile and Cincinnati. We got that one Ohio geography. So no one's from Cincinnati, clearly. That's good. It's gonna be a long night. What? <laughs> yes, yes, he's eating that. Um, like the joke for one is like I'm, I'm here all night. Uh, so what else? Okay, so basically. Um, I'm going to say a lot of vowels that I'll hold for a long time, so some of you are going to be very familiar with that, it's Midwestern. And then I'm also going to say you guys, no matter what gender. So, get used to that as well. Um, finally, I did work and live in Maryland for three years. Yeah! Uh, where I use um, Old Bay. Yes! Uh, Jesus, 
and I'm going to show you what God really thinks of us there. And then I'm going to take you into the to the hardly used parts of your Bible, uh, the minor prophets. Uh, and we're going to go, I'm going to look at a few places to prove to you that even there, God uh, says very similar things over and over again to us. So we're going to look at Zephaniah and Zechariah. So uh, some of you don't even know who they are. It's great. We're talking about So we're repeating this idea of purpose. Uh, we're very different places with God. I know that. I don't know. It's hard to do a conference speaking because you don't know where everyone is. Um, if you're not my group, but I do know that we're probably all in very different places with God. Um, some of us come to this conference feeling totally sold out. We feel sold out and bought into Jesus and this whole idea of Christianity. And other of us, others of us are just not so sure where we are. And some, maybe some of you are asking, like, why am I even here? Like, what possessed me to sign up for this and can I get out of here? For those of you who are not sure you call yourself a Christian, I want to speak just a minute to you all and just, you know, or maybe you're just not sure you identify yourself as Christian right now. Um, we're really glad you're here. Thanks for taking the time to come. Thanks for being courageous. That takes a lot of courage. Um, my hope for you and for me and for everyone else is just that we would get a sense of who Jesus is, that he'd become more believable and more beautiful to us. My hope is I'm not going to try to prove Christianity is true, necessarily, but I'm going to try uh, to show you that Jesus is attractive, and that uh, maybe you'll wish he were true, if you don't believe that right now. Or maybe if you do believe that, you'll want it to all the more be so. And so I'm really going to begin with our hearts and our imaginations, and then I'm going to move out, hopefully, throw our hands and our feet to our daily lives. And that's the goal for what we're up to this weekend. Um, and also, by the way, I'm here, I don't have my family here, and I'm going to talk at you for four times, um, but I also really want you to be able to come and talk to me. If you have questions or feedback, I'd love to talk to you about that too. So hopefully I feel approachable, um, I'm going to do the best I can to make some time. So if you, want to, if you have questions, come and ask about what we're up to. So with that in mind, let's look at Luke's Gospel. If you've got a Bible, I don't know, is it going to be projected? Maybe not. Um, it's memory. Uh, so it's the Gospel of Luke. We're going to look at chapter 2 and chapter 3. It's the of that. Um, Luke is a 24 chapter book. Okay? It's a 24 chapter book. It's something like the ancient biography of Jesus. And Luke, the author, is telling us his intentions in his introduction from the very beginning. He says he wrote this biography of Jesus, he wrote his narrative of things accomplished among us. So that people like us might have certainty about Christianity. Pretty bold claim. And Luke goes about giving us this certainty through telling us a story. A story. It's an interesting way of showing certainty. Um, and so now we're going to pick up this story, Jesus' story, in chapter 2, um, with 12 years after the birth of Jesus. Okay, we're going to look at a time when Jesus had pimples, his voice cracked. And as always, God was his father. So that's what we're up to. So um, where are we? We're going to look at chapter 2, verses 39 through 52. And we're also going to look at chapter 3, verses 21 through 22. Okay, so we're going to look at Jesus as a 12-year-old and then his baptism. Okay, that's what we're up to. So Luke 2, verses 39 through 52. And Luke 3, verses 21 through 22. Okay, if you're looking for it, it's after the book of Mark and before the book of John, last of the time. Okay, so actually, can we do this because we're a little tired? Let's stand through these scriptures. Luke 2, verse 39. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town in Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? 
Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why are you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying, but he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Let's skip now to chapter 3. We'll look at two verses, verses 21 through 22 of chapter 3. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice from, came from heaven, saying, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well Friends, these are the words of God, and they're more precious than gold, even much fine gold. They're sweeter than honey, even honey straight from the honey. Did you pray me? Father, thanks for this time. Thank you for the opportunity to look at your word uh, together. I know it's late. I pray for wakefulness. I pray for energy. I pray that um, you would help your word to enliven our souls. Um, and I pray for safety for the people still traveling. Uh, be with our time. Be with those who are absent. And I pray that you do a mighty work. Because you promised you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Thanks. I mean, we live in this time and this place when uh, there's so many people and activities all around us inviting us, our, our talents, our personalities, our gifts, our everything, to the, for to the forefront, to do a bunch of different things. I think about college and the way that college has changed. Even over the 10 years I've been doing college ministry, I think about this part of the world. Um, I think about the East Coast, the Mid-Atlantic, the Midwest, and I think about the relentlessly flattering and even promising demands demands for well above average grades, as well as rock hard apps. <laughs> for a, a stellar future, right? A job that's meaningful, but also well paying. A smoking hot spouse, but you know, also really sensitive with a great smile. <laughs> and, a, you know, also like these demands for time and the money to have really cool hobbies that you can talk about with your friends when you're not doing them and talk about how you're going to do them. And also that you can care about the right things that look the right way uh, with whatever is fashionable and whatever seems like it must happen. We live in a tough time in that sense. And I know, you know what's tough about it is that we're finite and we're limited and we can't say yes to everything. So what do you say yes to and what do you say no to? That's what this passage is all about. What do you say yes to and what do you say no to? When do we say yes and how do we say no? In our passage tonight, we see the infinite God of everything wrestling with the same exact questions as a finite, limited human being. Luke and the whole Bible give us this one snapshot. We have one scene from the childhood and adolescence of Jesus. And this is our picture. It's amazing to think we only have one shot from the birth of Jesus all the way to adulthood. And this is our scene. Okay, it's interesting. We hear Jesus speak for the first time in all of the narratives. Okay? And he opens his mouth, and what does he say? He tells his mother, Mary, no. No. He is exactly where he's supposed to be, in his father's house, verse 49. And then verses 39 through 40, 51 through 52 show us, and they tell us, the many times that Jesus said yes, even to his all-too-human, all-too-flustered parents in that moment. What gives Jesus the strength what Jesus gives you is the wisdom and the favor to know when to say yes and when to say no to like this. What is it? How does he know? Here's my guess. My guess is the answer to that question of what gives Jesus the wisdom to say yes and to no is deeper and more broadly applied than a schedule change. It's not like he's just got to get more efficient. It's not just another five life efficiency principle of thought. It's not saying no to sugar and carbs. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Okay? Rather, the evidence of this early scene of Jesus, especially when taken with his baptism, is that these things show us that Jesus' actions were rooted in his relationship with the Father God. That's where he's getting the strength to say yes and say no. Okay? Who Jesus believed he was determined how he lived. Who Jesus believed he was determined how he lived. It determined how he thought, how he felt, and how he acted. 
And of course, this relationship between identity and lifestyle also applies to us. And this idea is really important, so I'm going to put it two different ways by two very different kinds of people, just so we can get a big spectrum of what I'm talking about. Here's the first guy, it's a theologian named Sinclair Ferguson. And he says it this way, you are to other people exactly what you believe God is to you. You are to other people exactly what you believe God is to you. And then I have another way of saying it that comes from a former professor of mine, a Christian counselor named Jim Cofield. Less famous than Sinclair. Uh, but Jim, maybe because his name is Sinclair, says the same idea differently. He says, we are faithful to the images of ourselves that we carry. We are faithful to the images of ourselves that we carry. Similar to ideas, just expressed differently. Ferguson, Cofield, and the Bible are all telling us that we behave out of whatever we believe about who we are. We think, we feel, we act out of who we believe we are. Look, you can be a swan and you can act like an ugly duck. You can be a prince, but if you forget you're royal, you can act and you can feel just like a pauper. So I really just have two sets of questions that we're going to rotate around tonight. Okay? Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And what does that lead him to do and not do for us? Who is Jesus? And what does that lead him to do and not do for us? And second, who are we? And what does that lead us to do and not do? So who are we and what does that lead us to do and not do? And so our outlines, points, and verses repeat and examine these, these two ideas. Okay, so let me give you the outline. Okay, number one, I'm like a billboard, so I'm going to give you a billboard. Okay? Verses 39 through 45, and then verse 21, help us to ask a question. Who is Jesus as a human person? Who is Jesus as a human person? And the follow-up question is, what does his human identity lead him to do? Okay, so who is Jesus as a human person? What does his human identity lead him to do? Second, verses 46 through 52, and verse 32, or verse Chapter 3, verse 22, tell us this. So verses 46 to 52, verse 22, and it's over. Who is Jesus as the Son of God? And what does his divine identity lead him to do? Okay. And then third, and this is where the payoff is, the whole passage. We're going to look at the whole passage, chapter 2, verses 39 to 52, and the whole passage, chapter 3, okay, verses 21 to 22. And the question is, who are we? And what does our identity lead us to do? Okay, that's where we're going. We're going to look first, second, third, and that, in that order. So let's look at the first question, who is Jesus as a human person, and what does he do out of that? I'm going to see this in verses 39 through 46, and verse 21 of chapter 3. So if you've if you got a Bible, you can place your finger there and we'll look at that passage. So verse 41 sets the scene. Okay? Jesus and his family are going up to Jerusalem. They're leaving south from Galilee, and they're going to yet another religious festival. This time is Passover. Passover is a Jewish celebration of the time that God passed over the, the Israelite firstborn children. Um, and he killed all the firstborn children, the Egyptians. It's a long story after campus minister for clarification. Um, but basically, it's celebrating the Passover. Okay? And what, you know, that's interesting and important, but I think I just get really stuck on verse 42. I mean, if we're reading this closely, verse 42 is where we do a double take, isn't it? Jesus, the God of the universe, creator and sustainer of everything that was, is, and will be. <clears throat> Jesus is not just a human being, but thousands of years ago, Jesus was of all things a 12-year-old boy. Oh. It's worth wondering aloud together that Jesus didn't skip that dependent, fragile step of the newborn baby, right? God, with a neck that can't hold itself up, God with a bald, wrinkly baby head. God with other people having to wipe his hiding for him. God feeding on drops of milk. But here's my guess. If I took a poll of everyone in this room, the vast majority of us would, grab, would gladly rather change, we'd rather be newborn babies than revisit 12-year-old us. <laughs> Right? I know we're supposed to not live with regrets. Ready for my role relevant moment? YOLO, right? Um, <laughs> you only live once. I have to, you know, I have to make sure you guys know that. Um, but, <laughs> like, who wants to keep a social and emotional agony towards it? Who wants to 
go there again. I mean, being a newborn baby was way better, probably. Plus, you don't really remember it, so that's even better. Okay? So, um, let me just remind you, use a quote real fast, what it felt like to be 12 years old. Okay, this is from Wesley Hill. If you're just sort of getting sentimental about your puberty moments, let me just remind you what it felt like. He says, I felt mortified by the pimples covering my temples, nose, and chin. And whenever I tried to talk to someone else my own age, I could feel my face turning a hot shade of red, and my armpits <coughs> sweating. I would have preferred never to have had a conversation with any peer if I could have helped it. Feels right about to me. I remember when I was 12. Do you remember when you were 12? I was 12 years old, and I was in Columbus, Ohio. And I was swimming in a pool with my friend Peter. It was his pool, backyard pool. Uh, sort of above ground. <laughs> um, and anyway, we were talking, you know, what 12 year olds talk. We were half ragging, half knees knocking together. We were talking about what kind of girls we thought we had a chance with. <laughs> Isn't that what you do to 12 girls in a swimming pool? Right? And I made the, this fatal mistake of mentioning that I kind of thought I had a chance with my older sister's best friend's younger sister. And that's very confusing. Uh -huh. Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> Lisa. The name, when I mentioned that loud in that pool, it was like fireworks went off my little bony chest. <laughs> it was like the music that was playing around us all of a sudden turned soft and fuzzy and sweet. It was like the Phil Collins Tarzan soundtrack. <laughs> being shoved back and forth to the movies in my mom's powder blue Chevy Astro van. <laughs> like, this was like halfway ever after for me. But even more sadly, I decided to do the D at a middle school dance. Uh, do you remember these? Is this why you want to skip that stuff? I guess I hadn't really pictured what a middle school dance would feel like doing this. Um, somehow I had to cross the length of the gym. I'd have to lead the junior high guy safety zone. I'd have, to, I'd have to go into that no man's land in the middle, you know, like right around the sort of center circle of the, the basketball court. And then I'd have to be front and center before all these nervously laughing girls staring at me. So I did what any sixth grader with a bossy older sister would do in that moment. I asked my mom and my sister to straighten my curly hair. <laughs> they got the, they got the hair dryer out. You know, like the plastic extension with the straightener. <laughs> and with the towel. <coughs> and then I found, I went to my closet, and I found this preppy, perfect rugby collar shirt. You know, and I was like it had like you know this old. It was the eighties. It was the nineties. So it was like you know blue and yellow. And anyway, I thought this was perfect. And so I went to the dance, straight hair, rugby shirt. And I remember like on the way to the dance, checking myself out on like the windshield of the cars, you know? <laughs> like the front doors, kind of being like looking at my straight and curly hair. And just kind of looking at my, my outfit and making sure it like, really looked good. And I sort of like, I remember my knees were like shaking as I walked into the door. Um, and then I entered the dance and really like, honestly, like the rest is really blurry. <laughs> I mean, it's, just, it's just buried, it's deeply repressed, it's post traumatic. Um, I made my move, I think. Uh, Lisa said no, I'm sure. I went back to the guy's huddle. I asked Lisa to dance, redemption. I tried to recover my swagger, didn't happen. Too little, too late. I remember going home. Hanging up my little nice colored shirts, looking at my straightened curly hair, and um, feeling all the flooding hormones of total shame. Total shame. I hope that when I went to bed that night, that I'd wake up and become 25. I can't resist sharing this part of the story. It doesn't really have much to do with the, but um, Peter ended up marrying Lisa. <laughs> Wait, here's my point. 
point. Here's my point. Okay. Jesus became all of that. He became all of that. The church father, Gregory of Nazareth, of uh, Nanzanzius, says it this way. What Jesus assumes, he heals. What Jesus assumes, he heals. That is, Jesus assumed our, your and my, 12-year-old selves. In order that he might heal even that piece, even that scared strand of your and my stories. Jesus endured surging hormones, red-faced acne, sweaty armpits, social catastrophes, just so he could know exactly what we need by personal experience. Just so he could know everything there is to know about us and call us there and then out of our total and deep-seated shame and guilt and fear. I mean, just look at the solidarity he shows in this passage with this first century audience. People like us. He performs everything according to the law of the Lord. Verse 39. He goes every single year to a festival he knows everything about. Okay? To the required festival of Passover. Verses 41 through 42. And even humbling him up spiritually in the wilderness at baptism. John the Baptist's baptism in the wilderness was the first step, a sign of turning from sin. But Jesus, even as a 12-year-old, knew no sin. He didn't need to get wet. But he did. You see, Jesus got baptized in order to fully identify with us. Us. You and me. We. So prone to private and public moments where we love something too much. Where we love someone too little. Where we hurt ourselves and God and each other by thinking or doing what the Bible calls them. But you know, the story between Jesus and Jerusalem during the Passover and adult Jesus' baptism, these stories not only show us that Jesus is human, they also show us that Jesus is divine, he's the Son of God. And this is what we see in point two, and Luke chapter 2, verses 46 through 52, and chapter 3, verse 21. According to these verses, somehow Mary and Joseph lose track of their son. This is, this is amazing to me. Like, can you imagine Gabriel in heaven, like after he's told Mary that she's going to have God incarnate, going, ah! Like, <laughs> you lose the son of God, God incarnate, for four days. Okay, can you imagine that? Uh, finally, they look around to like the last place they could possibly look, the temple of God. And they see Jesus wowing all these people, these teachers in these crowds, with his answers, with his listening skills, with his questions. And then Mary then gets in this like full-on mom mode and confronts Jesus with all of her anxiety, all of her fears, and she goes in and blames Jesus for the last four days. I mean, this is my paraphrase, said Drew an authorized state of virgin. How could you, after the countless hours, Joe, your father, apprentice to do a carpentry? How could you, after the long nights we spent explaining all the Jewish festivals, how could you, you made us greatly distressed? You know, Jesus replies calmly with two incredible questions that give us a sample of what it must have been like in that temple with the Q&A session. How did you not know? And isn't it natural for me to want to be with my true father? You see, Jesus is telling Mary, Joseph and all the rest of us something extremely important that we can take to the bank. He's the Son of God. He is one in perfect love with the Father equal in power and glory. Therefore, it's quite natural for Jesus to say yes to the opportunity to spend time with his Father, learning about his Father from religious professionals. Only He's going to go to the place that's the only known home address of God at that time, the temple. And really, the words that God the Father speaks over Jesus at his baptism just confirm who Jesus is, right? They fuel his desire to act out of that identity. He says that you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. You are my beloved son with you I am well pleased. Jesus' belief, he believed that he was pleasing the beloved son of the living God and it made him able not to fear Joseph and Mary's disappointment. That's so important. To not take on their guilt over their distress, over losing him. And to not get defensive or intimidated by their great distress. And here's my question for us, just really quickly. How about us? How about you and me, 30-year-old, 36-year-old man? How are we doing with parental expectations? 
Oh look, Jesus' identity as pleasing and loved by the God the Father equally enabled him to say yes to his parents. To go back to Nazareth and be submissive to them, verses 50 and 51. Living out of God's fatherly love allowed Jesus not to need to prove his independence and rebellion. To safeguard his heart from not needing to do what others expected him to do as God. And hopefully you're already running the application grid here. Right? On all of this, seeing Jesus' example for us, but I want you not to miss it. I want you to see Jesus' power for this too. Sure, he cuts a fine figure, but he also gives us this power. We can imitate Jesus' ability to say yes and not fear missing out on everything. We can imitate Jesus' ability to say no and not fear disappointing people. Why? Because Jesus makes such a big deal that Jesus lived under the law. And he obeyed God's law. God's instructions for him to be good, to be a perfect person. Jesus met all these expectations from his circumcision on the eighth day of his after his birth, to going to all the festivals, to his baptism on his 30th year, and beyond. Ultimately, Jesus went all the way to self-sacrifice on the cross outside of Calvary. Jesus kept the law, included honoring his parents, so that his death what Jesus calls his ultimate baptism later in the Gospel of Luke. So Jesus' death on the cross could give us Jesus' identity once and for all, so that we too could have God's voice boom over us, just like it boomed over Jesus. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. With you I am well pleased. Look, I want you to notice what he's not saying, okay? He is not saying, you're forgiven, so fuck. I guess I have to tolerate you. He's not saying, you're forgiven, but don't you mess up. I'm so tired of cleaning up your messes. Jesus is saying, you're forgiven. Your moral debts have been canceled. You're beloved and well-pleasing to me. You're so righteously rich, you cannot spend yourself back into disdain with me. You are so rich, you treasure. I treasure you in my heart. And so we're already at the third and final point. Okay? Who are we and what does this identity lead to? Okay? We begin to see who Jesus is, we begin to see what that leads him to do. And for us, we have to start to see that we have a share in Jesus' identity. And that changes what we do. Right? You and I can be sons and daughters of God, beloved and well pleasing to the Father, merely by believing in Jesus. And this identity can help tell us when to say yes and how to say no. Okay? This is a mouthful. It feels pretty abstract, so let me give you a story. Okay? The story goes something like this. Jim Cofield, the guy I quoted earlier, that professor, okay? He's telling a story about driving his car to Pierce. Pierce, his son, is about 12 years old at the time. And he's riding shotgun. And Jim is doing this thing where they're talking and he turns on the radio and he makes some comment. And then there's a, there's a story about NASA. And Jim's son, Pierce, goes, Dad, do you think I could be an astronaut? Do you think I could be an astronaut? And Jim thinks about it for a while and he takes this opportunity to make sure that Pierce understands that he needs to work harder. And so he says, yeah, Pierce, I think you could be an astronaut if you really applied yourself to math and science. You know, NASA doesn't just take anybody of Pierce. And he watched his son just shrink in the seat. Just slap slowly down. Jim realized that what Pierce, his son, was really asking later, and he came back to him, and he said something like this. Pierce, you know what? I'm sorry for the answer the other day. Here's what I really think. I think you could be an astronaut if you really wanted to be. I think you've got what it takes in this life. you got what it takes. You see, Jim Cofield realized that we're all asking these questions about who we are all the time. And the questions you know, Pierce wasn't asking about a potential job. He was asking questions that we all asked to our dads and to our moms and to everyone around us. We're always asking, do I have what it takes? Can I make a difference? Am I special? Will you delight in who I am? And do you realize that these are our questions? They're the very questions we think that every person every opportunity can answer. And that's why it's so hard for so many of us to say no to anybody or anything. Because we need that answer. And it's so hard for some of the other of us to ever say yes to any of it. Because we're so afraid of what that answer will be. 
So often, instead of looking to who we are to answer what we should do, we do the reverse. We look to what, to what we do to tell us who we are. And this is the reason we struggle to say no to the resume drill that we don't really want to do. This is the reason we take on yet another extracurricular that we don't really like. And maybe that's not you, but maybe this is the same reason that you and I stress over how we left it. Because we had to with that person, that family member, that friend, that boss, that boyfriend. Because deep down, many of us believe that the person or the project will tell us who we fully and finally are. They will tell us that we matter, that we're delighted, that we, and that's why we take on people's guilt, that's why we take on the fear of disappointing people, because we're so sure that they're going to give us the bottom line of who we are. But what would it look like to say yes and to say no, to live out of God's approval instead of for approval everywhere else? What would it look like to answer who you are before you answer, what should I do? What if all our questions were answered by God in the universe, finally and fully in Luke chapter 3, verse 21? Am I special? Will you delight in me? What does he say? You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. <coughs> Period. It's finished. Do I have what it takes? Can I make a difference? With you, I am open. Period. No conditions, no other references necessary. In the words of a pastor in front of mine, Ricky Jones, God is telling us, everything I have, everything I am is yours. Therefore, we don't have to live based on performance. Based on what other people want us to be. We don't have to hide, we don't have to blame. We can just be who we are. We can experience God's love as we are. And Jesus, you are beloved and well-pleasing. And this truth helps us greet opportunities and meet people with enjoyment versus competition. It helps us to greet people and meet opportunities with freedom versus guilt of not doing enough or the fear of disappointment. Okay. Father, well, thank you for this time. Thank you for your words to us. Thank you for um, reminding us of who we are. I'm thankful we can come to you and that you boom through your word. That you boom through the word preached. That you boom through your songs. That you boom through friendships. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved son. With you, I'm welcome. Help us to believe that, wherever we are. Please.